What is so special about concrete that many of the oldest standing buildings are made from this material, many of which have inspired 3D artists to create some of the most epic settings? But these settings require realistic textures, sometimes for freshly cast concrete, sometimes for old and damaged concrete, and many times for somewhere in between. The problem is that when it comes to realistic textures, we know all too well how frustrating it is to search the web for hours and not find a single texture that fits our purpose. But what if we had a procedural concrete texture, one that can be instantly applied to any object without any need for UV unwrapping, or even better, a customizable texture that can be configured to represent different ages of concrete? Wouldn't it be worthwhile to set up a procedurally generated texture which contains virtually infinite detail that automatically adjusts to the view distance? I say it's absolutely worthwhile. So in this video, let's find out if we can generate three separate textures for concrete. One for the base material, another for chemical damage, and a third for cracks. If we achieve these separately, then I'm pretty sure we can come up with a way to layer them on top of each other to get the ultimate one-size-fits-all concrete material. So to get started, with this model selected, I'll create a new material and then jump over to the shading workspace, which I usually rearrange to have more room to work in. As always, by default, Blender gives us this principled BSDF node, which has way more parameters than we need. To replace it with something a bit more simple, let's delete this, then use the Add menu and the Search field to bring in a Diffuse node. For the base layer of the concrete texture, we need a rough, bumpy surface, so I suggest we bring in a Musgrave texture node. This, along with a texture coordinate node, a map range node, and a bump node should be enough for the base layer of our concrete material. Let me point out that we can use the parameters on the Musgrave texture and the map range nodes to increase or decrease the roughness of the surface. This allows us to model aesthetically pleasing architectural concrete or normal, everyday concrete with no surface treatment. Now, moving on to the first layer of damage in the form of chemical deterioration, my intuition says that we can use the very same nodes as we did for the base layer of the concrete texture. So let's quickly add those nodes again. But given that this texture is meant to be added as a layer on top of the base concrete material, we also need some sort of masking operation for this setup. Let me show you what I mean by adding a mix shader node. And a math node with its operation set to greater than. This greater than node helps us hide or mask out areas that are not damaged. And as you can see, the threshold parameter on this node can be used to change the spread of the damage. Keep this in mind, because we will come back to it later. As for the second layer of damage, which isn't a form of cracks, I suspect we need to be a bit more clever since it's going to be a bit more elaborate than the previous one. Luckily, I do know that we can generate randomized lines over any surface using a Voronoi texture node, a texture coordinate node, a map range node, and a bump node. We now have some random lines over the surface, but these are too clean to have any semblance to cracks, so let's drop in a noise texture node and a mix color node. Here, 
The mix color node combines the random output of the noise texture with the coordinates given by the texture coordinate node. This scrambles the coordinates as well as the lines produced by the Voronoi texture, making them look like random cracks on the surface of the concrete. Keep in mind that the scale value on the Voronoi node allows us to set the frequency of the cracks, while the parameters on the map range node let us adjust the thickness of the cracks. But the more I look at this texture, the more I feel that there is something missing. These cracks don't look as natural as I had hoped for. It seems like they lack enough variety. This, fortunately, is an easy fix since we only need to duplicate the Voronoi and the map range nodes to generate some secondary cracks and then add a math node with its operation set to minimum to merge these secondary cracks with the primary ones. Now if we take the secondary cracks and make them more frequent by increasing the scale of the Voronoi texture, we immediately generate enough variety to make the overall result look substantially more natural. Just compare what we had before with one layer of cracks to what we have now using two layers. At this point, I'm pretty happy with how the cracks look. And all that remains is to add a masking operation so that this texture can be layered on top of the base material. To do this, we obviously need a mix shader node where the factor input will be the masking value. But this time, instead of a simple mask, I want to try something a bit more advanced. So let's bring in a noise texture node, a map range node, and a math node with its operation set to less than. With this setup, the less than condition generates a masking value that omits some regions of the cracked texture. This allows us to control the spread of the cracks using the parameters on the map range node. Keep this in mind, as it will become very handy very soon when we attempt to animate the growing of the cracks. With the three layers of a concrete material in place, it's time that we prepare to combine them. The first step is to turn each type of damage into a node group. So let's select these nodes, then from the Add menu, choose Make Group, at which point Blender combines all the selected nodes into a single node group and moves us inside of it. Aside from the benefit of making things organized, the other advantage of using node groups lies in these sockets on the input and output nodes. These sockets let us take any parameter inside the node group and expose it to the outside. For example, this connection exposes the mask value calculated by the less than node. With this connection in place, from the side panel, we can configure the output. Now, let's do the same thing with the min and max values on the map range node, connect them to the group input, and give them a proper name. Now if we press tab to jump out of the node group, we have this crack generation node, which from now on can be added to any material. That's perfect. So let's switch over to the other damage layer and turn that too into a node group. I have to confess. I'm a bit nervous about how all of this is going to look like at the end, but there's only one way to know. So let's jump back to where it all started with the base concrete material. First, let's bring in a mapping node, which through its scale value allows us to easily adjust the overall size of the texture. Now to add the layers of damage, bring in two mix shader nodes, along with the two node groups which are now accessible from the add menu. This looks so good. And not only that, but having access to the internal parameters, we can easily customize the degree of damage. Just make a note of their limits. 
As for the ultimate test of this procedural setup, let's add some animation keyframes to the parameters and create a time lapse animation of our concrete material as it ages and gradually shows signs of damage. Now, if you like this tutorial and want to learn more about procedural methods in Blender, click on the next video. As for this one, thank you for watching, and until next time, take care.